Hello, everyone. Much like Savik's paper, um, this, while this paper is about virtual reality, there's actually no roaming in this experience. It's a fully seated experience. Um, but it's, it's very, I think it is prevalent to the, to the roaming topic. So my name is Sebastian Hersher. I am a PhD student with Professor Ken Perlin. And this work comes out of the NYU Future Reality Lab. So uh, VR has been kind of exploding, and people have been very excited about it and have this idea of what VR experiences are like. Uh, this is kind of the fantasy of it. But for a lot of users, both in VR and users outside, this is kind of the experience a lot of people are having. Many people, for every one person that's in a headset, there's at least one person either waiting for their turn or uh, just disappointed that they're not part, having part of the fun. So there's some, been some pretty phenomenal virtual reality experiences and games that have been created over the past few years, but they've been really focused with a in the design space of one or a very small set of people at, at a time. And uh, some of the results of this are fear of missing out, extremely long lines and wait times, and ultimately a lot of people talking about virtual reality experiences and not many people actually doing uh, or experiencing them. So uh, part of the way that we could potentially change or augment that is to look to the design and interaction spaces of traditional media such as cinema and theater, where we have large groups of audiences such as the audience here in front of me who uh, share in a, uh, both the experience and the audience experience outright together. So uh, with that in mind, we took the uh, design spaces of traditional media and worked with it with the limitations of the VR ecosystem and hardware available at the time and came up with four design hypotheses of how we would approach creating a virtual experience for a large uh, cumulative collective audience. So it starts with, one, that the audience should be fully represented in the experience. Uh, prior work has shown that representation of audience members or collaborators affords for a higher level of immersion and enjoyment in an experience. Two, that proximity between audience members should be preserved. Local proximity uh, has been shown in prior works uh, and traditional media to have effectiveness uh, with neighbors and collaborators uh, in with quality of experience. Three, that the audience should remain seated. This is uh, tied to the current limitations of virtual reality technology. Um, free roaming experiences have not managed to scale well to a large audience. Furthermore, traditional media has shown success in having a seated audience for experiences, which also helps with simplifying logistical and operational and technological constraints. And finally, four, that interaction should not be required to drive forward the experience. Interaction with an experience often increases complexity with each added participant, and which can hamper scaling and throughput. And furthermore, both traditional media and 360 VR experiences have had success with limited to no interactivity. So once we've had these design hypotheses in place, we decided to actually create an experience uh, in order to test and, and uh, evaluate them. So we set out to test these hypotheses through an implementation and presentation of a six minute virtual reality short called CAVE. CAVE includes many dynamic visual moments and effects, including the arrival of a woolly mammoth into the virtual space uh, that was significant lo significantly larger than any of the viewers. Uh, a 30-member virtual audience was implemented, separated into two groups in a thrust stage theater format. Uh, the virtual and physical proximity between the audience members was maintained in line with the design hypoth hypothesis too, but the distance between the two wings of the audience was augmented to be greater in the virtual environment than it was in the physical environment. As we were embarking on creating CAVE, we actually had to build a custom system in order to get to the scale of 30 users at the same time. And in order to fully implement and deliver it, we developed Cavern, or the Collective Audience Virtual Reality Nexus, a lightweight software, software architecture for the synchronization both of the experience and the pose information of all connected clients. By compressing and filtering all client data across the network, Cavern allowed for the full reconstruction of a live virtual audience during the delivery of the narrative experience. So we presented CAVE at SIGGRAPH 2018 uh, last year. And instead of telling you about it, it's kind of better if I show you. So I'm just going to play a video. If it plays, are you going to play? Are you going to hear? So 
audiences were brought into a cinema-like environment and seated in a theatrical style seating. You can see in the video that there were many, uh, we added multiple very striking visual elements in order to uh, give the audience more than just the core narrative to look at and explore in the space as they were seated. So uh, uh, yes, great. So we brought Cave to Cigarette 2018 and over the course of four days, 2,000 people got to see it uh, in groups of 30 at a time. We were able to survey and perform a, a, a mixed methodology study in tandem with the presentation, collecting 317 survey responses and 21 interviews. Uh, it was a 43 question survey and a, and a 10 to 15 minute semi-structured interview. And the, we then took and analyzed the results from that study and broke it down into three thematic responses that um, directly respond to the design hypotheses. The first of which is the audience as a unique feature of the experience. So 57% of the audience uh, that came to CAVE actually came alone. And a majority of the participants strongly agreed that they were both felt like they were part of a live virtual audience, but also felt that the presence of the audience increased uh, the quality of the experience. Uh, the presence of the audience was reported by many participants and interviews, interviewees to increase both the immersion and comfort in their experience, some noting that they were able to tell where to look and where the audience was by being able to see all of the virtual audience's response to the content. It is worth noting that even some participants reported not having the need to directly interact with the other audience members, but just that the presence alone uh, uh, allowed them to benefit, uh, they benefited from it. Uh, the second uh, theme that we uh, pulled out of the results is that traditional media actually served as a great point of comparison in figuring out what worked and what didn't work in the experience. One of our intentions in this exploration of collective VR was to adapt conventions of traditional media like cinema and live theater and examine whether specific features of this performance offered a unique set of affordances for the creator. And we, participants have reported that the VFX and the scale of the content of CAVE, such as the scale of the mammoth and the particle, particle effects on the wall, were uh, only available in cinema, tr the traditional media of cinema, and not available in theater. Whereas uh, the audience representation and format in CAVE could be replicated in theater, but not replicated in cinema. Both the scale of the content and the audience format stood out the most to uh, participants, to the majority of participants. And finally, the third result that we were able to uh, theme that we pulled out is that audiences did really want more interaction during the experience. So when we uh, first implemented CAVE, we implemented it on the Google Lenovo Mirage Solo, which didn't have controller support during it. So we were unable to give them uh, hand support at the time. Uh, what was the most interesting uh, find from, from the analysis of, of the study was that while people really yearned for interaction, they, want, they yearned for interaction significantly more with the environment or other audience members over interacting with the story. 32% wanted interaction directly with the or influence of the environment. 18% wanted to interact with other audience members in the virtual environment, while 10% and less wanted to interact either with the story and the characters or directly control the story itself. Uh, we had an interesting note that many of the participants reported on the tension between having a linear narrative or having a shared collective experience and adding interactivity into it, uh, feeling that while they could add interactivity, it might detract from the experience and might not be necessary, and that there might be techniques for us to pursue in order to add, such as having the digital characters acknowledge the audience, uh, that might be able to serve uh, to increase immersion without adding direct interactivity. So now we'll move on to reflecting on, on those themes and actually and analysis uh, to provide some insights for future research. So uh, we observed that a majority of the participants both understood and enjoyed being part of a live audience. Since most of the participants came alone, it is significant that the presence of others still served as a positive part of the experience. Furthermore, despite the lack of direct interaction between audience 
uh, members. Implicit interactions between, in, in, between audience members served as an important role in the experience. The, the collective audience knowledge, knowing where people were looking, actually served as, a, as part of a, the positive impact. Simply seeing the other audience wings was a memorable aspect, which improved immersion and comfort in the experience. Uh, secondly, many viewers wish for more interactivity, but reported being more interested in interacting with the virtual environment and the other audience members, as opposed to directly interacting with the narrative, which there is where there's been a lot of uh, work in developing interactive experiences in VR. Enabling richer audience and environment interactions might satiate a participant's urge for interactivity while maintaining them as a passive member of the narrative. Furthermore, passive and active acknowledgement of the audience by virtual characters, such as a quote unquote wink from the actor, may satiate audience content engagement without explicit interactivity, allowing us to satiate that urge without adding complexity to the, to the system or experience. And finally, that the medium release does serve as an amalgam of the two traditional media, that uh, the, the special effects presented were really only possible in uh, cinema, while the audience format and experience was only possible in cinema, or sorry, in theater. The, ad the adaptation of both the cinematic and theatrical elements offers a unique set of design affordances that, you know, the multiple audience formats of theater can be leveraged while the content scale of special effects of cinema can be introduced. Uh, to create a uniquely positive and immersive experience for the participants. Um, on top of that, just as, a, as a, another note, CAVE actually went on to uh, be accepted to Tribeca Film Festival, so we were able to get our research work actually out into a cultural sphere for, for consumption and was able to be seen by 2,500 people at Tribeca, an order of magnitude more than any other experience. And on top of that, it was brought in uh, the art paper that is paired with this technical paper was uh, uh, accepted to SIGGRAPH 2019 and won Best Art Paper Award. So it was, it's, it's a really amazing opportunity to take our, I just reflecting on it personally, it was a great opportunity to take our work and have it reach uh, such a large audience and also, um, you know, be able to spawn more than just a technical implementation. So on that note, uh, my name is Sebastian Hersher, and I am very excited. This is Cavern, and I'm very excited to answer any of your questions. All right, questions. <laughs> How would you compare that to, say, an online viewing where all the other viewers are represented as crowd around you. So we had a lot of audience, um, uh, we had a lot of participants report that the actual co-located nature of the audience um, was uh, an active positive uh, effect that that having who they came with, having won the opportunity to come with multiple people if they came in a group was a positive uh, thing and then being able to be part, have that physical and virtual mapping um, was a positive effect. Yeah. And the second question is, I guess there's a difference between representation of people just in the near environment around you than people that are very far. Is is that a diminishing effect? Yes. So so one of the another core cool thing that we found out was that um, people commonly really care about their proximity and the, the physical and virtual mapping of their proximity. You really care about your neighbor, but once you start getting into further distances and, and further groupings, like different groupings such as the two wings, we had the physical wings set up um, really close to each other, almost that the, the two front rows could touch knees in, in, in the room, but the virtual wings were much farther apart because we had to walk a mammoth through. And we found that um, if your physical proximity, or if your local proximity was correct, that you could do really interesting things like cheat the other wing out. You still want that presence, but you can start really toying with what those map those mappings can be really nonlinear. Uh, yeah, Daniel Leitinger, University of Colorado. Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, I really enjoyed the experience myself when I tried it out at SIGGRAPH. Great. <laughs> and uh, interestingly enough, I had a lot of nonverbal communication with my neighbor, even though you know there was only so much one can do when rotating around the head. But I, I, I felt very, very present in that moment. And it felt very similar to an experience like Sleep No More, where you kind of wear a mask and you're in the audience, but you also have this anonymity. Uh, so to me, that was much more like you know, watching a video next to somebody on YouTube in VR. But I, I was wondering, um, given the technical capabilities of 
say, uh, capturing people's facial expression, is that even a, a direction you want to take it to? Because it seemed like a very interesting experience with that anonymity as well, that, that added in dimension. So I was wondering if you could reflect on that just a little bit. Absolutely. So from a technical perspective, um, I've been working on building in the, as much user data as we can, getting that synchronized across a large audience. But I will say from a content and aesthetic and directorial approach, um, I, I think you hit the nail on the head that part of the um, somewhat anonymity with some customization is actually uh, some people prefer that rather than representing themselves as specifically themselves and their movements. Um, it also helps with this, the, the avatar problem that uh, for every experience you have to make, you have to make a, a more than one, you have to make a set of avatars or, or character representations and of, of your audience. And um, it's definitely easier to have a set of anonymous masks or facades than saying I'm going to tune a bunch of avatars for um, you know very high high fidelity facial input. Um, but that being said, it's an extremely interesting thing that I, I'm really excited to see what uh, actually came out at OC6 with the work that they're doing on like hyper realistic avatars. Um, it's all green pastures, honestly. All right, so let's thank Sebastian for that great presentation. And, and let's thank all the other speakers, too. Uh, ju just a few quick reminders. So remember again to vote for the